And now to introduce our speaker, who's well known, uh, the member for Pittwater in New South Wales since 2007, and currently the Minister for uh, Planning. And today, Minister Stokes is going to talk on the topic of planning, progress, and productivity post-pandemic. Rob Stokes, you're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Jared, and uh, thank you very much for the opportunity of speaking with us all this evening. Um, while we are small in number, I know there's uh, people online as well, so I'll address my comments both to you and also to everyone listening. I'm unaccustomed to using notes, uh, but I understand that that is the, the way in which things are done, so I will stick firmly to my notes. Um, I also note uh, the Japanese Consul General, Nasuhiko, great to see you here this evening. Um, and uh, and uh, I, again, uh, thank you so much. I, I noticed in politics, uh, there is, to, to use some of the, uh, the academic terms, uh, so much of politics is in the being at, at places, at events. This uh, past 18 months has not been possible. So a lot of politics is then in the doing of, of the activity of making policy and making decisions. Um, sadly, there has not been enough opportunity, I don't believe, for, for, for the thinking part. And so that's why uh, organisations, particularly like Sydney Institute, are so important to provide the discipline uh, for, for political leaders and other thinkers to actually uh, provide a thoughtful contribution toward the, the, the being and the doing. What kind of world will emerge from COVID-19? What kind of world will we need to make sense of? What kind of challenges and opportunities will we face? British philosopher John Gray once observed that our first and hardest task is to understand the present. It's easy to speculate about the future or to pontificate about the past, but it is immensely dif difficult to understand the present. Our present is a challenging place. A generation ago, just 30 years, the teleological progression of Western liberal democracy that began in the wake of World War II seemed unstoppable. The defeat of fascism, the demise of colonialism, and the rise of the welfare state led Daniel Bell to declare the dawn of the 1960s as the end of ideology, with the global north achieving a broad consensus on political values and an exhaustion with grand ideological debates. 30 years later, Francis Fukuyama declared an end to history, essentially finding that Karl Marx was right about the eschatological inevitability of human progress, but wrong on which economic system would prevail. Rather than the command and control totalitarianism of communist practice, liberal democracy was the adaptation that natural selection chose in the economic evolution of human society. The American peace had begun and contemporary globalisation was unleashed just at the dawn of Jeremy Rifkin's third industrial revolution, powered by new energy and communication technologies. Global cities, newly defined by Saskia Sassen, emerged as the islets through which the threads of global trade were connected and directed. As George H. Bush declared in 1990, a new world order of globalism and multilateralism in international relations, trade and investment had begun. Over the past 30 years, however, this new world order has been shaken. 9-11 and the war on terror, 2008 and the global financial crisis, the Arab Spring, Trump and Brexit. Yet through all the turmoil, multilateral institutions have remained intact. Free trade agreements have been negotiated, executed and largely respected. The global movement of ideas, goods and people, trade, travel and truth, the lifeblood of globalisation, accelerated all until 11th March 2020, when the World Health Organization declared that a new form of coronavirus, which had emerged in China two months earlier, had become a global pandemic. Since then, there have been almost 150 million cases of COVID-19 recorded globally, and more than 3.1 million deaths recorded. Suddenly, each element of globalization, the new world order, was under assault everywhere, and all at the same time. National borders have slammed shut across the world. Even state and provincial borders have closed in federated nations. Global supply chains have been severed as national survival prevails over the interests of free trade. 
The free movement of people and of goods, the very lifeblood of globalisation, has been tourniqueted and it will not be long until limbs begin to decompose. As globalisation withers, its great opponent, nationalism, is re-energising. The rattle of sabres is being replaced with the rattle of keyboards as state-sponsored cyber attacks open a new front in gunboat diplomacy. Bellicose rumblings around the world are awakening dormant militarism, making the world less stable and less able to communicate productively. So with a globalisation, that is certainly the conclusion of some commentators. We certainly need to take note when the champion of neoliberalism, the economist, leads with the heading Goodbye Globalisation on the cover of its 16 May 2020 edition. When Stephen Walt, Professor of International Relations at Harvard, declares that COVID-19 will create a world that is less open, less prosperous and less free. Or when Canadian economist Jeff Rubin, observing the invocation of the Emergency Procedures Production Act to manufacture ventilators at an, ab at an abandoned car factory in Michigan, noted, don't leave it up to the market when you really need things done. That's the bottom line here. I don't think people are going to forget that. It shouldn't have taken a bat peeing on a pangolin to bring this into focus. <laughs> Certainly, globalisation will change. It already has. In response to what the IMF has labelled the Great Lockdown, nations around the world have imposed export prohibitions on goods as essential as medicines and medical supplies in defiance of the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. National and subnational governments have issued 107 563 travel related measures since COVID 19 was declared a pandemic, with almost 29,000 characterised as entry restrictions. Restrictions on our economic, personal and social lives, strictures that pre-COVID would have been unthinkable, are viewed as normal and necessary. Democracy has been delayed, most notoriously in Hong Kong, but everywhere, with 78 national and sub-national governments deciding to postpone elections and referendums owing to the pandemic. The progress that seemed inevitable in 1991 is now uncertain. Of course, John Gray would have us believe that human progress is illusory, that the modern myth in which humanity is marching to a better future is mere superstition, a thesis that earned him the title of the philosopher of pessimism from the New Statesman. I choose to believe otherwise, that human progress is possible, albeit not inexorable. As Edward Carr put it, change is inevitable, progress, however, is not. But in the context of the Australian present, where droughts, fires, floods, plagues of mice and pestilence have shaken our faith in global institutions and frameworks, what does the broader global dislocation augur for Sydney? Having defined the present, what does it mean for us? How should we respond? Patrick Geddes, long regarded as a founder of the planning profession and acolytes such as Ebenezer Howard, likened a city to an organism, less an object or an assemblage of buildings, and more an embodiment of the humanity, past, present and future, which created, sustained and defined it. In the same way that our bodies are a complex network of interlocking and interdependent systems and processes, a skeletal system, a circulatory system, a respiratory system, a central nervous system and an incubatory system, to name a few, so too can a city be characterised as, as a series of processes rather than as an object. Just as a virus can ravage a human body, so too can a, project, 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 a protracted pandemic wreak devastation on a city. Adopting Getty's metaphor of city as organism, I argue that the same disciplines and reforms that can make our bodies resilient to COVID-19 can similarly make Sydney resilient to the impacts of the pandemic. The World Health Organisation suggests the best response to COVID-19 is to become well informed about the virus, the disease it causes and how to pre uh, prevent its transmission. Aside from uh, avoiding the disease and limiting its spread, there are a number of risk factors over which we all have a measure of control that can increase human resilience in rebounding from COVID-19. Fitter people have a number of advantages in dealing with the challenges posed by the virus. Physical activity can improve the clinical conditions that are most frequently associated with severe COVID-19. Active people have better control on high-risk comorbidities that increase susceptibility to severe COVID-19. And while being fitter can improve the body's resilience to COVID-19, being fatter has the opposite effect. Obesity, for example, is linked to impaired immune function, reduced lung capacity and reserve, and increased risk of hospitalisation 
due to COVID-19 infection. The higher a patient's body mass index, the higher the risk of intensive care intervention, mechanical ventilation and death. The same factors that constrain the ability of the body to recover from COVID-19 apply to the resilience of a city and indeed a nation state in rebounding from the pandemic. Fitness, not fatness, is the key. Recent debates about the future of Australia have focused on our, our size. Should we aim for a big Australia? Indeed, the story of our nation's modern growth and development has been linked inextricably to the expansion of our population. The post-war economic boom was fuelled by the post-war migration boom. It was population growth through immigration that helped Australia steer successfully through the GFC and beyond. The link between prosperity and population has long been controversial, split between cornucopian conceptions of endless growth and Malthusian predictions of resource constraints. Such debates led Robert McNamara, erstwhile president of the World Bank, to declare that population is the most delicate and difficult issue of our era, overlain with emotion. It's controversial, it's subtle, above all, it is immeasurably complex. For Australia, the debate has moved from theory to reality. COVID-19 has closed our borders to the immigration that has traditionally fuelled the economic growth machine. In New South Wales alone, our population projections have been radically redrawn. By 2031, we are now projecting a state population a million less than we are anticipating at the beginning of last year, opening up a decadal difference in the population we are expecting and the population we will have. Each day international borders stay shut, the demographic consequences mount. According to traditional economics, this means our growth will be irrevocably affected, that as population growth slows, so too will production, capital accumulation, employment, incomes and savings. Therefore, we have no choice but to change the way we think about economic growth and change. We cannot any longer simply rely on immigration as the feedstock for economic development. We have to first recognise and then utilise other tools to power our economy. In the absence of strong population growth to boost the number of workers and consumers in our economy, we instead need to provide existing workers and consumers with more opportunities to increase their productivity and more confidence to invest and innovate. The ideal way to boost productivity is through education. The best way to provide more opportunities for investment and innovation is through new technology. Both of these tools are best forged in our great colleges and universities. Here is the irony. Just as population growth has relied on importing migrants, tertiary education has relied on importing students. Immigration and education have been two of the terrible economic casualties of the pandemic. The challenge that has generated our economic predicament by disrupting the prevailing model of growth has also presented us with the solution to the problem. Rather than focus the, the, the strategic gaze of our great universities offshore, we need them to look at home first. In one sense, this should be self-evident, that our universities and colleges should exist in order to support the needs of the Australian community. It is sad that federal funding decisions have forced our public universities to reorient their business model to serve the needs of foreign students rather than those at home. The pandemic provides the opportunity for us to use our universities smarter, to boost the productivity and opportunity of our community to produce a long-lasting economic benefit rather than to prop up a fundamentally unsustainable business model over the short term. Along with education and technology, the other levers to promote economic growth in the absence of strong population growth are tax reform and regulatory reform. Lower, more efficient taxes can drive confidence and in investment to boost productivity, as can regulatory reform to make it easier to invest and to increase workplace flexibility. These are the levers we have to promote a stronger, thriving economy in the absence of enhanced population growth through immigration. These are the tools we must use to face the reality of a pandemic-induced slowdown. Just as a patient needs to change their diet after a health scare, so do we need to change our economic prescription in light of COVID-19. Rather than a lazy economic approach of promoting productivity by getting bigger, we need to promote productivity by getting fitter. Now that the big Australia proposed by Kevin Rudd is a faded dream, we need a fit Australia to ensure that we recover from this shock and a match ready for the next round. The fit not fat prescription applies to urban policy too. Our city has changed over the last 12 months. Suburban high streets are prospering. Office are bustling, uh, suburban offices are bustling with energy. Public spaces are alive with activity. Suburban economies are strong. 
Commercial, industrial and residential real estate markets are buoyant, with limited stock and strong demand powering prices to new highs. Streets that were once empty are full again. Yet, buses that were pre-pandemic full of commuters heading to offices in the CBDs of North Sydney and Sydney are now half empty. While our suburbs are full of life and activity, Sydney CBD has been depopulated. Its nightlife diminished, its beautiful public spaces are vacant. Office buildings and their owners face an uncertain future. Downtown shopping centres are seeing subdued trade. Hotels are crying out for guests with no international tourists in sight. In one sense, the pain endured by the city is salved by the gain to suburban and regional centres. But negative impacts on the value of CBD real estate will create negative impacts for millions of Australian families. Commercial property accounts for almost a tenth of the assets held by Australian superannuation funds. The income generated by these assets underpin the retirement incomes that millions depend upon. And not just investors, but small businesses in the CBD, cafes, creatives, are all at risk. As US urbanist Ed Glazer puts it, if pandemics become the new normal, then tens of millions of urban service jobs will disappear. That's why the New South Wales government has provided a package of more than $50 million to breathe life back into the Sydney CBD and support those urban service sectors that have had the most challenging year since World War II. But government investment alone is not enough. The way in which we work in cities is changing, and changing for good. COVID-19 has sponsored the, the donut effect, driving residents and businesses to the larger spaces and remote working in the suburbs, with video conferencing and cloud-based sharing, making workplace flexibility a permanent feature of the labour market. Impacts on our CBD are profound and without intervention, permanent. Civic life as we know it is under threat, with everything from home working to home delivery and home cinema undermining the public realm. While the future of our city will look different, we do have an opportunity to build back better. Government is investing a, 30, uh, a further $30 million with councils across New South Wales to bring back our central business districts without bringing back the traffic, the congestion or pollution. We have an opportunity to give people more choices than just privately owned motor vehicles and to rethink our streets as shared spaces joining communities together rather than as roads separating and segregating us on different sides. And rather than just swapping our, our combustion engines for electric vehicles, we have the chance to shape our towns to need private cars less. Our CBD building owners have to be part of the solution. The old certainties of steady commercial rental returns have evaporated. Floor plates need to be reconfigured. More natural ventilation and fewer touch points will be required in building refits. More thought needs to go into enabling a blended model where people might choose to work big hours in the CBD two or three days per week and then spending the next four or five days working more flexibly from a home that could be anywhere from a half hour commute to a three or four hour commute away. We'll need more small apartments in central CBD locations with a greater diversity of tenure types. Some may be owned outright, some may be serviced, some may operate using a dual leasing model with one tenant leasing Monday to Wednesday and the other Thursday to Saturday. Car parking will be less significant and more options for household services in the CBD and not just in the suburbs will be required. There is a darker potential consequence of the rise of workplace flexibility. In the new geography of jobs, Enrico Moretti criticised the notion that globalisation would lead to a dispersal of jobs away from cities, provided that CBDs became innovation districts where high knowledge based workers gather in agglomerations of inventive and entrepreneurial energy. Now that knowledge based workers are agglomerating virtually and not physically, well, then surely a professional working from a home office in Roseville or Roselle can be replaced by a professional working from a home office in Manila or Mumbai. The economic disruption that decimated the retail sector can just as easily dislocate the services sector. And while global supply chain disruptions increase opportunities for locally produced goods, we need to appreciate that a welcome boost to local jobs and investment will bring with it some of the forgotten externalities of manufacturing, industrial and logistics landscapes, increased energy consumption and polluting emissions, rising living standards have increased our demand for goods, but domestic deindustrialisation has separated our population from the processes by which those goods are produced. More local manufacturing means that more of us will see to adopt Bismarck's observation, how the sausage is made. 
The fact that the pandemic has promoted the decentralisation of our population from dense centres to sprawling satellites also raises some troubling questions. While it should come as no surprise, the, the pandemics of the early 20th century similarly sponsored the rise of the bungalow and the garden suburb, well, but what does it mean for our investment in transportation, utilities and services designed to facilitate urban consolidation? W what additional pressure will be created for urban expansion in the wrong places, at the cost of biodiversity and at risk from bushfire? Could changing settlement patterns induced by COVID-19 exacerbate risks of future zoonotic pandemics as disruption of ecosystems increases the likelihood of transfer of viruses from animals to people. The reason I point to these challenges is not to deflate confidence, but, but rather to call for it. Ultimately, confidence for, for all of us is a decision. It's easy to be confident when things look rosy, but it's important to be confident when faith in the future is a little harder to justify. As in crises of the past, uh, history tells us that we will rebound. There will be a recovery. In many ways, it's happening right now. But we will rebound to a new normal. Things simply will not go back the way they were before. The economic model that sustained growth in Australia of simply importing more people to support demand and supply skills has collapsed as border crossings have collapsed. While of course we need to find a way to support the free movement of people, it will be different. The most optimistic demographer will see that a return of mass migration and a restoration of Australia's population trajectory has been derailed for years to come. As borders open, migration demand will likely rush to Australia. Now is the time to develop a population policy to guide the decisions we will then have to make. A higher education system underwritten by a vast and growing supply of international students is simply not feasible. Even current efforts to reintroduce overseas students via a lengthy quarantine process will be expensive and only amount to a trickle of what is needed to go back to a model that is now demonstrably broken. Our universities will need to export ideas rather than import students to balance their books. The implications of the China sword policy for local manufacturing now stands as a prophecy of how local manufacturing must respond to supply chains that are disrupted and consequentially distrusted. The optimism of free trade must now be conditioned by the lived experience of economic nationalism and the need to ensure that our people are not exposed to a shortage of necessary goods because of trust in the infallibility of laws regulating international trade. Equally, the stark separation of uses in our cities and towns between residential and employment districts needs to be revisited in light of the need to make it easier for people to work from home or closer to home. Agglomeration of industries and workers needs to be achieved through technological connectivity and not just spatial density. There's nothing natural about a vibrant, thriving city. The great centres we love around the world are a result of people, buildings, exchange and movement. However, there's nothing permanent or inherent about them. The pandemic has taught us that we need to work hard to constantly reinvent the urban experience that makes Sydney such an amazing global city. To return to my metaphor, when, when a body recovers from a disease, the immune system is changed and stronger. Research indicates that those who recover from COVID-19 may mount a much faster and more effective defence against the infection if they encounter the virus again. Our cities are the same. We need to support one another through this pandemic and keep our urban processes functioning. The fitter our cities, our education system, our property sector, our system for funding and building new industries and services, the quicker we shall recover and the stronger we shall be to withstand future shocks but we need to train harder still to identify the opportunities from the new economic order that will emerge when the world reopens. So now we come to questions and discussion. We've got some people on Zoom, we've got some people in the room, um, and I'm gonna try and take the, uh, could you give me my phone? Thanks. I'm gonna try and take the Zoom questions. I'll be over here. So let's set up. Minister, if you just come up here, and I will disappear over here. Um, so, as I said, thank you for a very thoughtful presentation. So, as the Minister for Planning, from what you've said, you've probably got, probably got, certainly got a different role, probably a more significant role post the pandemic than you had before the pandemic. So does that make you and your department busier or less busy? 
Um, I think... Uh, 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 certainly busier, certainly busier. Uh, there's been a great opportunity to do things that we haven't been able to do in the past. I think there has been a belief in this country, in this city particularly, of the inevitability of growth, that uh, if you can um, uh, resist it, it'll still happen, it'll just go somewhere else. I think the pandemics made communities realise, well, if you can resist growth, it will go, um, and it may not come back. And I think people are becoming aware of the externalities of not growing. And you only need to look at cities around the world that don't grow to see, uh, far from being more beautiful, the, the lived experience and the statistics will show, tell you that they are more dangerous, they are less clean, uh, they are uh, more inequitable, uh, and they are less healthy. So um, it's ironic this city's always had a very strong NIMBY movement. Uh, I think the lived experience of the pandemic has made many of the NIMBYs take a broader view of growth uh, and recognise that the opportunity of participation is not to stop everything, rather it is to shape the sorts of things that you'd like to see by, by shifting growth or, or moving what it looks like, but not stopping it. So it's made it a lot busier. So I have a Zoom question here, our first Zoom question. Um, I'm summarising it, but the question is about the division between local councils and your department. And this uh, member of ours uh, is brave enough to say that she or he is from Wallara. And the suggestion is that Wallara Council flicks things off to your department rather than resolve them themselves. I mean, this may or may not be true, and you may or may not wish to comment on it. <laughs> uh, so so, so um, we, we do have a system that provides opportunities for things to be put in the too hard basket or kicked off for someone else to make a decision on. That's been one of the delightful unintended consequences of the pandemic is that people now recognise they need to make decisions on things. Uh, my experience again is decision, uh, delaying a decision does not improve it. Uh, in fact, it, it complicates things and it also sterilises what other uses might have happen in that area if a particular application is not approved. Sitting on a decision just stops anything from happening anywhere. Um, so yes, I, I, I mean, I'm not going to comment specifically on Wallara, um, but it is a common technique of councils, particularly with things like rezoning applications that are politically difficult um, to, to kick them along so someone else has to make the decision. Uh, but we're happy to help them. But I think the opportunity for councils is, well, if they want control, they have to make the decisions. Uh, if they don't make the decisions, they lose control, and I don't think that's what their communities want. I'm just going to adjust the microphone slightly. Can you just talk to the room? Yeah, Sorry. I, I will. Just talk down the back Sorry. Minister, uh, thank you for a, a characteristically philosophical speech, and, and I must say it is quite enjoyable to listen to a leader in public life and be educated at the same time, so really appreciate the effort you put in to that speech. I want to challenge you uh, on two fronts very briefly, Jared. I'm, I'm mindful that this could be a comment. The, the first is to say the history of urbanisation over the last couple of millennia is seemingly inexorable, and the concentration of people where jobs, opportunity, education, social opportunities uh, exist has really characterised every single country on the face of the globe. And secondly, there is a case for greater optimism than the optimism we showed tonight. And that is to say that when we were looking back 102 years to the Spanish flu, we had no answer to that. When SARS came along 10 years ago, we had some kind of answer to that, but we never really resolved it and there was no you know, ultimate health outcome. We now have half a dozen companies around the world that have a really serious ability to deal with a fast-moving, highly variant virus in a way that you know, was simply not contemplatable even 15 years ago. I actually think that history is going to show the mega trend is going to continue, that cities will be the beating heart of all of our nations into the future. Those gateway cities will continue to have the greatest opportunity for social and economic prosperity. How would you respond to that? Oh, I, 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 please, I wouldn't disagree with any of and if that. The, the, um, the, uh, if it came across my speech that it was an anti-city speech, it certainly wasn't designed to be. I think the, the reality is, though, 
the, um, the, the, the border closures, the supply chain um, breaches, uh, the challenges to global cha trade, all of these things um, uh, will, will change the nature of globalisation. They are the lifeblood of globalisation. You cannot continue with globalisation it was if these things continue to be closed down. I think Ed Glazer's comment was more, the longer it goes, the more profound the consequences become. And I think that needs to be something that we're all very much aware of, because literally each day that the pandemic, that the borders stay closed, that has a, a, an impact on our population of, of hundreds of people a day. And of course, that is cumulative over time. So, so we, we can't you know, uh, underestimate the impact that that is having. Uh, and, uh, and whether we like it or not, that has now changed the decisions we have to make in the future. I do think the nature of our city regions will, will likely change. It was probably just with so many things in the pandemic, just accelerating trends that were already underway. But I think our understanding of a city region will move more from Metro Sydney to even Sydney, Newcastle, Wollongong to Melbourne to Brisbane as a city region or Singapore to Shanghai as a city region. Uh, so they won't be entirely urbanised uh, in, in, in spatially, but, but, but philosophically they'll be urbanised, uh, that, that people will benefit from being part of, being connected into that city region. Uh, but many of them are the agricultural areas, but they'll just be part of a broader city region. And I think what you're seeing with the decentralisation underway now, and our statistics are now showing that that is now actually starting to happen. I never actually was sure that it would, um, but it is starting to happen. But it's going to centres that fall within that, that, that broadly defined city region. You know, people aren't moving to Broken Hill, they're moving to Orange, they're moving to Port Macquarie. So that's consistent with that overall city region across Eastern Australia. If you just speak to the end of the room, I've got a question here from uh, Michael Moulds who asked, land use planning in New South Wales lacks flexibility. Will this be changed in the near future to ensure investment is not lost to other states or countries? Yeah, yeah, so, I mean, it lacks flexibility compared to what would be my question. Um, I know we had this wonderful um, system uh, set up a little while ago of planning ministers across the country who came together in, for the first time to discuss uh, urban policy nationally. Um, and one thing that we all shared with each other was that um, industry told all of us that ours was the worst planning system in the country. Um, so they can't all be right. Um, I think the challenge we have, and certainly when you look at a planning system like the United Kingdom, that's one that's geared much more against growth than our planning system in Australia, so, or in New South Wales. I think the challenge we have is we straddle both the American zonal system and the British discretionary system, and it brings out sort of, in one sense, the worst of both systems. Uh, and of course, my lived experience of talking with applicants is Sometimes they want certainty and sometimes they want flexibility. And uh, so you need a system that can accommodate both things at different times, uh, but you can't do both at the same time because they obviously contradict one another. Uh, so I think the flexibility is about the discretion for wise decision makers uh, to make sensible decisions uh, about, um, about applications. Uh, the challenge is treasuries often like us to have ticker box exercises that, that restrain decision makers from making decisions. So you're left with a computer says no sort of uh, system. I prefer a discretionary system. Again, the challenge with discretion is discretion opens the door to corruption and that becomes a cultural issue. Uh, but nevertheless, um, there are plenty of examples around the world where they have discretionary planning systems and they, they allow us to have better outcomes than a, than a, than a, than a, than a sort of decision-making machine allows you to do. Now let me and know if there's someone in the room who wants to ask a question. So next we um, Alan Harper asks, if regional centres are expensive, uh, I'm sorry, if regional centres are expensive, expected to grow, I think. If regional centres are expected to grow, what are the New South Wales government's plans to improve country rail? Yeah. Well, there's a couple of things. Uh, I mean, the, the most important connectivity uh, is actually uh, a communication connectivity. Uh, so internet services, mobile phone services are actually the most important things in terms of workplace flexibility. Um, that's not to say country rail is not important, uh, but you also need to get 
to real densities, if you're going to use them as commuter services effectively, mm -hmm. like they do in Europe or the UK, uh, you've got to be careful what you wish for. In those situations, yes, so for example, British example, the train from Coventry to London uh, takes you, it's, it, the distance is about the same from, from Newcastle to Sydney. Uh, in Sydney, that, uh, that, that, uh, that, that trip in Australia um, is much faster than car, by car than by rail. But in Britain, it's much slower than by car than by rail. So the worse your roads are, the more impetus that mm. provides to improve your rail services. So they're sort of in inverse proportion. You, you, you. Um, uh, I think in, in in the country, we need to take a roads first approach, uh, and uh, and then commuter rail services because again, the scale of urban settlements still aren't at the level that would justify that sort of investment in, in what are effectively commuter rail s services. Although we'll see an interesting experiment between, I, I believe, between Lithgow and Parramatta, because that's getting to the point at which you've got an electric service going all the way. I think there are growth, growth opportunities in a town like Lithgow as more a satellite of Sydney, um, a, a, as a result also of the, uh, the economic you know, sort of centre of Sydney shifting further west. Uh, you, you're getting down to a sort of an hour and a half commute by rail to Lithgow and that opens up all sorts of opportunities. But further out, the, the costs become um, very significant. Now Frank Con Con Conroy asks, has the pan a pandemic allowed your department some breathing room to slow urban development? I, th I think we need to be careful about the, the concept of slowing urban development. I, I think I prefer the idea of catching up in terms of uh, the disconnect between uh, infrastructure provision and population growth. Uh, I think there are a lot of assumptions made, certainly, I mean, one of the classic ex assumptions I saw when I was Education Minister was the assumption that people who live in units don't have children. And as a result, uh, the schools uh, in those areas were simply not able to cope with demand because that was the planning assumption of the time. So it has given us breathing space in one sense to prepare ourselves, um, but I don't think the idea that uh, uh, that uh, in one sense, planning responds to demand. We don't control it. Uh, so um, I, I think there is an opportunity with this breather in our growth uh, to, to, to catch up. I would be concerned if the pause in our growth was permanent. Uh, if that's the case, then we need to prepare for it. Um, but I think we will, we will see the consequences uh, in coming years if we continue to stay shut. It won't occur straight away, but it will happen. A little bit like in Europe, I think something that people have forgotten is here, I mean, you know, how fabulously uh, privileged we are in this country. When our schools closed for a few weeks, uh, they all went online. When schools in European countries closed for a year, they closed. And we will see in a decade uh, the impacts that will have on opportunities for, for children, for vulnerable families in terms of equality in those societies. Um, we, some of the impacts of this pandemic uh, will, won't be realised for, for a decade or more. Uh, and I am concerned about the impacts of the slowdown on our population. When I mentioned in the speech the need to look at a population policy, that was not necessarily population control. That was just to control the, the, the decisions around why and where we grow and the sorts of skills we need because I think we've never really been properly in charge of that before. Uh, I think it's odd we have policies on absolutely everything other than the policy about the feedstock for growth that drives the need for all the other policies. So we go Andrew, Anne and Howard. Um, Andrew, can you have a, given the anticipated growth that you see in the hinterland, do you see that? Do you see the VFT uh, very fast train being dusted off from Gladstone to Geelong? Well, certainly in New South Wales, so we've got uh, the British expert Andrew Norton to do some work on on some preferred routes. I think I'm not saying anything out of school. I might be, but I, th I think the the the, the 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 sort of the existing route down to Wardenara is the one that shows the highest um, uh, benefits as opposed to costs. I think, you know, longer term, um, the, uh, the route down to Canberra is also compelling. The route to Newcastle as well. The, the route to Newcastle is just a little more problematic from, a, from an engineering perspective. They're sort of the, the starting point though. I think any VFT will start by connecting uh, reasonably proximate centres because once you're 
going any more than about three or four hours, air travel is still much more compelling. Uh, even if you can get to Melbourne in four hours by train, you're still going to take a plane. I uh, declare my interest in favour of the walking class. Um, your predecessor, Prue Gower, had a draft policy that if a developer were to develop apartments within 800 metres of a transport hub, there would be no requirement for parking. Um, in that idea, as we know, about a third of the cost of a block of units is in the burrowing down and putting in car parks. And as you're obviously seeing, there's huge changes coming from this pandemic, including the fact that within another 10 years, perhaps, cars won't be anywhere near as necessary as they've been. And the more car parks you build, the more traffic jams you create. Um, so how we got Very quickly, yes. Yeah. I, I remember asking this question of some people very senior in your department quite a few years ago, and, asked them why they didn't go ahead with that policy, and the answer was because the Telegraph didn't want it. Um, Harold, we're going to get to the end of this, right? Oh, you always sense me, Jerry. Um, Minister, is it time to revive that policy and allow developers to consider the market and whether people do need car parks or whether we'd let the market decide? So, Harold, the first thing I'd like to say is, when you walked in the room, I thought, thank goodness I've got a, a nod to pedestrians in my speech. But, uh, <laughs> But um, the, the short answer is yes, and I would refer you to the design and place state environmental planning policy that is uh, under discussion at the moment, uh, and that's precisely, I was aware of the process at the time, and I think time has moved on that we now have more opportunities with, with urban centres that are based around transport-oriented development, where now things like, for example, when, when Peru had that policy out, the North West Rail hadn't been built, for example. So there weren't the public transport alternatives. Now there are, so there is a compelling reason as to why those developers can move away uh, from, 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 from car spaces for every unit, for example. So that is currently, uh, uh, it's just concluded on exhibition, I understand, uh, but there's certainly uh, the issues that we are looking at, uh, because that'll also have an impact on affordability as well. Thank you. Question here. Yes. Uh, well, thank you for uh, your thoughtful uh, observation, uh, pointing out many factors to be considered, uh, including population policy, and uh, the uh, COVID accelerated, uh, triggered uh, um, uh, investment uh, across the country and the state. Uh, as uh, I observe, as I work. Uh, to facilitate the uh, uh, investment uh, uh, in uh, Australia from Japan, especially in New South Wales, uh, I observe uh, two uh, attractive uh, uh, points uh, of Australia. One is uh, resource-rich uh, nature, uh, related to hydrogen, for example. The other one is uh, uh, the opportunity for smart infrastructure, uh, both supported by high-tech startup and innovation education opportunities. So the, my question is, uh, uh, how can, uh, uh, what is your uh, vision and view, uh, how, how to promote uh, those two uh, attractive uh, aspects of Australia and New South Wales through uh, your role uh, to drive uh, planning and improvement? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Consul General. The, the two comments I would make is the first way, as, as referred to, is, is some regulatory and tax reform. They have always been in the too hard basket and we haven't had to deal with them because population growth has allowed us to sort of not deal with the structural reform um, that, uh, that we would otherwise have to deal with and that other countries have had to deal with. So we should deal with it anyway. Um, and, uh, and certainly now we don't have any choice, so we have to, and I think dusting off the Henry tax reform and starting to look at some of those ideas is not a bad start. The, the next comment I'd make is in relation to your, um, your comment in relation to certainly the education side of it and uh, the need for, 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 for smart skills around those things. I think we actually do need to call out our universities to, to think a bit more strategically about what they do. I'm fascinated by, for example, you go to Israel, you go to Switzerland, the universities that operate in those jurisdictions, their legislation prescribes what they are to do, uh, what, what sorts of research outcomes the state would like to see from them. Um, my argument is if they're funded by 
the community, the community should have right, some right to direct the sorts of research that they do. Sure, they might have some flexibility to do other things, um, but do these things first. We don't make those requests of our universities, and we should. Uh, we, we should. And in my experience of talking to them, they would love to know what it is we would like them to do. Um, but to give them those sorts of tasks and direct their efforts, uh, I think it's extraordinary that we haven't done that to date. And I think also the state have, has a big role here. Victoria has been more successful at this in the past than New South Wales. They proudly put in their number plates the education state. Um, I largely can't say anything else, but 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 um, <laughs> but but but, but, um, but but I think we should assume that mantle from them, and uh, because the the universities are established under state legislation, uh, so we sort of palm them off and say, oh, it's a federal issue. They fund them. Uh, well, we should direct them and use them as uh, as extensions of our of our economic vision to 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 increase prosperity for everybody. Minister, you touched on. Uh, quick rail, Lisco, whatever, to the west and we've headed in the airport to the west. But if you look at where people want to live and everyone carries on about the west getting hotter, people want to live by the coast. And um, recently I heard that in Victoria, where they have Ballarat, Bendigo, they're working on very fast communication by rail so that people can live in Ballarat, Bendigo um, and work in Melbourne CBD. What's, what's the problem with the rail link between Newcastle and Wollongong? Because I've heard that maybe it's because they keep going in and out of all the nice little seaside hamlets where people wanted to holiday. Is there a problem about reconstructing a rail service that bypasses those nice little hamlets and becomes much more efficient? Is this the problem with Newcastle and Wollongong? So um, I, I'd point, point you to the work that Andrew McNaughton is doing for us. Uh, I mean, I, I, again, I'm a little bit um, loath to say too much because it's in my colleague, the Transport Minister's portfolio, uh, but effectively those those four routes, the one to the west, the one toward sort of the southwest to the to the south and the north have all been investigated and I understand prioritised. I understand it's the one to the south that is the most compelling. I understand uh, from a um, from a cost benefit analysis, um, uh, but uh, that that again is from from the top of my head. But they are all being investigated. Uh, I, I do think though that um, that those sorts of connections are important for us to consider. They are huge investments, and there are others that need to be made first. Uh, one of the challenges of the lost opportunities because we just sort of marched out and did lazy growth because it was cheap land out west, we just continued to, to march further and further out. And I think people have forgotten when Bob Carr was Premier, he actually uh, effectively abandoned the idea of transport links to, I think it was called S Sydney in its third century. Basically, I, I said, look, we'll build the towns of Rouse Hill, but we won't connect them. It was a deliberate strategy at the time. And we lost 20 years where those things could have been done, where they became much more expensive. We need to finish those bits before we think too much about the others. Because even if, for example, uh, NARA were to add another 10,000 people, in the scheme of growth, that's a trickle. Uh, uh, when we're looking at Camden growing by 10,000 people a month, for example. Uh, so, so, so we need to focus on, we need to have our meat and veg first before we have our dessert. And, and the, 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 the West Metro is, is really has to be a massive priority, as well as the transport connection to the airport, although Infrastructure Australia will tell you even that uh, was not, you know, it, it, certainly from a state perspective it made a lot of sense because the Federals were playing for half of it, uh, but on a pure cost-benefit analysis there were even more compelling public transport projects to invest in and, and the West Metro is probably the most significant of those. So we need to do those urban connections first from a utilitarian perspective of the greatest good for the greatest number. And that's not to, 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 to say people of the bush aren't important, of course they are, but Sydney is the big driver of our productivity and that's good for everyone in the bush as well. Just to clarify for those who are not from New South Wales, talk to the end of the room. Um, the structural problems you're talking about Newcastle to Nowra is what? Is tunnelling, is bridges, is that sort of... Oh, it, it's environmental constraints. It's, and again, I'm, I'm adding on, yeah. uh, you know, uh, talking away from my portfolio, yes, but it's also legislative constraints. You've got to go through national parks, for example. Uh, you've got some cliff stability issues. You've got a whole range. I mean, building railways in 
these sorts of terrain is very complicated. Uh, and uh, but if, if, I mean, you ask an engineer, can he can 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 he or she do it? They'll always say yes. The question you need to ask is how much it will cost. And uh, and I guess the challenge is on a cost benefit. You've got this chicken egg problem that you don't have the population to justify the means by which you can increase the population to justify the investment that would. And you see where I'm going. It's just this big circle. We're getting close to the end. Have I missed anyone? I haven't missed anyone. So um, finally. Just give us an idea of what it's like. I know you can't talk about cabinet policy, but what's it like in cabinet these days? What comes first, the pandemic, planning, general health? Uh, what, what are the priorities when you? Oh, well, we'll wait for Brad to turn up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. um, so, so no. Um, it, look, cabinet processes have become actually much sharper, and I, I'm. Uh, I mean, it's, it's horrible to say this in one sense, that, uh, that I'm enjoying the pandemic because, of course, there's a great deal of suffering to a lot of people. But from the purpose of being in government, this is why we do what we do. You don't... You, in one sense, governments aren't as necessary when, uh, when the market is looking after itself. Uh, governments need to stand up when there are challenges, and that's why, from, a, from the position of someone who's interested in policy, this is a wonderful time to be involved in government. And also, I see an unprecedented opportunity to do things that you couldn't do at other times that need to be done. And, uh, and that is compelling because I know every day is, uh, is a day toward opening up when the priorities will change. So we need to use the, the, the here and now to do things. And some of the regulatory reforms that even people in the room might be interested in, now is the time to talk about those. Well, I think that's a good spot to end it on. Um, I'll just say briefly on behalf of our, our Zoom members who've sent in questions and comments, and on behalf of those of us here in these pandemic times, Thanks for a very lively presentation, um, talking about planning and a very thoughtful paper um, and a lot of very interesting comments which we reflect on. So we're very grateful you've come. We, you were, we were hoping to have you here a year ago and the pandemic struck and you're the first person back on our list and we're very grateful for that. So for tonight, Minister, thank you and we very much enjoy publishing your paper and filming it as well. Well done. Thank you. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you.